Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, Constitutional Convention and uh, four elements I'm going to deal with. First, the Convention's deliberations as philosophy. Second, as the maneuvering for advantage and the clash of interests and pressures, what we normally call politics. Uh, third, if we get to it, a little bit about the political science of the Convention. And finally, uh, the lessons, the moral and political lessons that the Convention teaches us. First, the uh, Convention examines basic philosophical ideas about politics. We are moving, and they were moving, from theory and very abstract theory to limits on power and, uh, and the operations of power, the machinery, as Gordon has said. If you look at the, the very beginning of Federalist Number 2, uh, John Jay, one of the few jo ones that John Jay wrote, uh, he says, well, we all know that natural uh, rights have to be limited by government and that people give up their natural rights in government. A very different tone from the Declaration of Independence, which simply asserts the natural rights and says government exists to secure these rights. Jay is saying, and the Federalist in many ways is saying, we've got to talk about the limitations, we've got to talk about the use of power, not just about rights. I think you can go in political philosophy to one basic question. I think Gordon would agree to it. The basic question in political philosophy, or a political philosophy, is what is the view of the nature of man? And once that is stated in a political philosophy, a lot comes out of that. Richard Ofstad, many years ago, wrote a wonderful book called The American Political Tradition. And his first chapter is on the Constitutional Convention. And his first paragraph uh, says this about the, their view of the nature of man. The men who drew up the Constitution in Philadelphia during the summer of 1787 had a vivid Calvinistic sense of human evil and damnation and believed with Hobbes that men are selfish and contentious. They were men of affairs, merchants, lawyers, planter businessmen, speculators, investors. Having seen human nature on display in the marketplace, the courtroom, the legislative chamber, and in every secret path and alleyway where wealth and power are courted, they felt they knew it in all its frailty. To them, a human being was an atom of self-interest, they did not believe in man, but they did believe in the power of a good political constitution to control him. So this is what you might say is a pessimistic, realist, maybe cynical view of the nature of man, but that is the core belief that you find in the constitution itself. Uh, another thing, uh, this view of the nature of man is particularly view, uh, on view if you read Hamilton's numbers, numbers 16 and number 15 we'll be talking about later. Well, what does Hamilton say is the nature of man? Look at number 6 uh, and, num and number 15 too, where Hamilton says, men are ambitious, vindictive, rapacious, they have to be controlled. Uh, you leave them alone, they will screw each other. Uh, and not in very pleasant ways. Uh, and he says, unlike Jay, who says, well, you know, everybody loves the union, everybody gets along together, and so on, Hamilton doesn't believe that at all. Unless you control these vicious tendencies, uh, that, and he believes with Hobbes in those vicious tendencies, all hell will break loose. And interestingly, uh, in number 15, Hamilton anticipates and refutes two current theories about peace among nations. There's one theory that if nations just trade with one another, they will be peaceful because they'll be more interested in uh, prosperity than in war. And he says that's nonsense. Commercial nations fight each other just as much as non-commercial nations. Uh, there's another theory today that's uh, called the democratic peace theory that we haven't had world wars because of the spread of democracies. And nations that are self-governing and democratic never fight wars. And he doesn't know about democracy, but he does know about Republican government, and he goes through this long list, historical list, of Republican governments, Republican regimes that have fought each other just as much 
as non-Republican regimes. So he's refuting 200 years in advance the theory that democracies don't engage in war. Uh, all right, that's a basic philosophical point in the Constitution, the nature of man and the reasons to be suspicious of the nature of man. And you see that in the theme of Federalist 51, too. A second influence, uh, philosophic influence, is the importance of economic influences on government. Long before Karl Marx, uh, James Madison said that economic interests are the dominant kind of problem in uh, government. Let me read to you from Federalist 10, which you will get to and read very carefully. But here's what uh, Madison has to say uh, about uh, the uh, conflict in government. So strong is the propensity of mankind to fall into natural anim animosities that when no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. But, here's the marks, but the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Class warfare, in other words. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors fall under a like discrimination. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, with many lesser interests, grow up of necessity in civilized nations and divide them into different classes actuated by different sentiments and views. The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms a principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of party and faction in the necessary and ordinary operations of government. That's another presumption. Life is not harmonious and everybody's going to get along together. Government is about resolving clashes of interest. Another theme is that power is necessary and power is dangerous. Uh, the theme that's on the syllabus from Federalist 51 runs through the Federalist. If angels were to govern men, there would be no problem, but angels don't. If men were angels, there would be no problem. Uh, but in fact, in a real government, uh, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, and this certainly now includes women, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. You must have power, and in this next place, you must oblige it, the government, to control itself. And that's a very difficult balancing act that they try to do. Um, so, they have these theoretical assumptions, and at the same time, they're relying particularly on experience. The little phrase in Hamilton's uh, number 51, where he says, experience is the best oracle of wisdom. Forget about theories, and, and even, you know, so, sarcastic about, well, we have all these utopian thinkers, he doesn't use the word utopian, we have all these abstract thinkers who think this will be easily resolved. No, it will not be. We have to go to the best oracle of wisdom, which is our experience. And our experience has been oppression from Great Britain, inefficiency and incapacity in the Articles of Confederation, uh, difficult state governments, rapacious and uh, un incompetent state governments. And that's what he's concerned about, the experience and what that uh, teaches us. So there are these basic philosophical ideas running through uh, the Constitutional Convention. And then there are more abstract ideas. I'll just touch on this briefly because Gordon's going to get to this much more extensively. The idea of constitutionalism, which he's just talked about, the need for a strong government to control rapacious men, which he certainly gets from Hobbes. Uh, and if you look at Federalist 51, the tone of that always strikes me. He even capitalizes words like obedience and coercion. And you see this as kind of a strict schoolmaster. If you people don't behave, I'm going to tan your hides. Uh, and he keeps coming back. And Madison is much more gentle. Uh, but strong government is necessary, and that comes out of Hobbes. Uh, a third kind of 
uh, attempt, and this is the genius uh, is, uh, of the Constitution, is how do you combine a large state, we're going to have a continental nation if they can pull this off, uh, with international prestige, ultimate economic strength, and at the same time combine that with the virtues and the participation of the small republic that uh, was represented by the state governments. Uh, and they will try to say that the Constitution does both of those things. In the process, they create a lot of interesting political mechanisms. I'll just run through them very quickly. Federalism, ingenious kind of idea. Uh, federalism insulates conflicts uh, and allows some conflicts to be taken out of the national level. Uh, what would it be, have been like, for example, if uh, the Supreme Court had not uh, um, passed judgment in Roe v. Wade on a national right of abortion, but it said every state can make whatever policies it wants on abortion. Would that have made the controversy less uh, difficult, less heated, and so on? Probably, whatever your view on abortion rights would be. Or, more recently, Supreme Court on the right to die has, in my view, wisely said, that's not a federal matter. If Oregon wants to create a right to die, fine. If other states want to prohibit it, they can do that too. Uh, and that is a way to handle conflict by diffusing it. That's an invention, to a great extent, of the convention. The uh, same time they create a second invention is a national citizenship, uh, something that gets uh, consolidate even further in the 14th Amendment. Uh, by having national citizenship, Hamilton is very strong on this in the 15, in Federalist 15, uh, you create a national loyalty, not just a state loyalty. Uh, the, I, another idea that comes through here is filtration. You'll see this in Federalist 10. Uh, the conflicts of politics, which can become very heated at the local level, uh, if they get filtered up to the national level and filtered through virtuous representatives, uh, they can be diffused. You can get a more peaceful kind of system. And finally, the idea of judicial review, which is not specifically defended, but implied in the Federalist Paper. Uh, and Hamilton in 15 already is saying, there's always coercion in government. You either coerce through law and judgment and courts, or you coerce through arms. And so if you want a more peaceful government, put the coercion in the courts and in the law system rather than in the army. And finally, the doctrine of popular sovereignty. This is a very ironic invention because nobody at the convention, and neither Madison nor Hamilton, believed in true popular sovereignty. And yet, the Constitution is defended as an object of popular sovereignty. Uh, the very first three words of the Constitution in the preamble, we the people of the United States of America create this Constitution. Who ever thought of this idea? People as a whole are sovereign in a government? But that's the implication of the preamble and of the justification for the Constitution and the Constitutional Convention. Uh, we'll come back to that as well. This is the first element, the philosophical background and the philosophical ideas that these people take very seriously. These are people who know their sources, use their sources, and believe in them. But the second element of the Constitutional Convention uh, is very different, and that's the Constitutional Convention as a political exercise, as just the same kind of thing that we see in Trenton or Washington, D.C. The article by uh, Roach, that's optional reading, uh, John Roach, classic article uh, in which he said, call, what's the title? The Founding Fathers, a Reform Caucus in Action. Uh, and this is not some group of philosophers or seminar on political theory. This is a bunch of politicians getting together and making deals and doing the kinds of things we're used to politicians doing. He's got a wonderful phrase in there, which he stole from somebody else, saying that in this article he wants to raise the founders to mortality, not to immortality. He wants to take them away from immortality and raise them, raise them, not lower them, 
to mortality. Uh, and that reflects the people who are there. All the delegates to the Constitutional Convention were people with political experience. I think all but three had served in a state legislature. Um, and so these were grubby politicians. Uh, they were not people like Gordon and me who spend our time in classrooms. Um, they had been in legislatures and knew you know, how to make a deal. Now, here are some of the things that are interesting. Uh, one is the concern for success over principle. Politicians are much more interested, good politicians, are much more interested in getting something done rather than defending a principle. Uh, and you can see this from the beginning of uh, Hamilton's number 15. The catalog of misfortunes in number 15, the thing he starts off with, he says, you know, this is an idiotic government. He uses those words. Is there anything wrong with government that has not befallen the United States under the Articles of Confederation? And he's got that wonderful long paragraph uh, about everything that's gone wrong. And he ends it by saying, this has gone on too long. You know, I don't want to continue to catalog these misfortunes and so forth. Let's get on uh, with the job of writing a new constitution. And so that means that they have to accept certain realities uh, of contemporary politics. They have to accept the existence of states in some form. There has to be some kind of federal bargain. It is probably true that if Hamilton had his druthers, he would have abolished the states altogether. And Madison possibly would have been ready to do that too. But you can't do that. It's just not politically possible. And so they make a big show of how wonderful the states are and they're going to be preserved and so on. Uh, and people might even call them hypocritical. You don't really believe that, but they're accepting the reality of the time. The other thing they're accepting is that somehow or other, we got to get people to agree to this. We've got to get popular consent. And many of the people at the Constitutional Convention didn't think people were very smart, uh, including Hamilton. Uh, but that's a necessity, and they've got to get it, and that's a political response. Uh, and finally, they've got to agree on something. There is this sense of a great crisis going on, uh, and so we will accept all kinds of things we don't like. And James Madison, you know, is known as the father of the Constitution, and that implies that he wrote most of it and so on. In fact, if you go through the Constitutional Convention, there were lots of roll call votes on different provisions. Yeah. Uh, 550 roll call votes. Madison lost a majority of them. Uh, Madison was by no means the writer, the father of the Constitution. But you wouldn't know it from the Federalist where he's, you know, extensive in his praise and everything in it is just a wonderful thing. Uh, Madison continued to regret uh, things that the Convention had done. He particularly regretted the loss of uh, the provision that would have allowed Congress to veto state laws. That was in the original Virginia plan. Congress could just knock out any state law. Uh, they had to give that up. To his death, Madison regretted losing that provision. So what was he doing? Success is more important than principle. Another thing about ordinary politics. Ordinary politics is affected by the environment in which politics is taking place. And I'm sure all of you have been in Independence Hall and uh, seen the room in which the Constitution was written. Uh, it's a remarkable place in many ways because it is not a legislative chamber. It's a big drawing room, and not a huge drawing room either. Maybe the size of half of the cave. Uh, this is a small, intimate environment. Uh, people are able to talk to each other they cannot debate because there isn't the framework of two sides of a chamber. They've got to talk to each other, and they do a lot of that. It's a secret environment, remember. People can bargain. Uh, any provision at any time that has been voted on can be brought up for a vote again. Uh, not the normal Roberts Rules of Order where once you settle something, it's done. Things kept being brought up. The 
big question about representation in the Senate was voted on 16 different times, uh, and so they were willing to consider and reconsider. Uh, they were isolated uh, and, and in constant personal contact with one another. You remember W.C. Fields had this crack that uh, there was a contest in, uh, for something or other. The winner got a week in Philadelphia, and the second place got two weeks in Philadelphia. Well, they had four months in Philadelphia, uh, and they're off by themselves. Uh, you know, there are whores around, but otherwise there's no female companionship, and no one. Uh, if you saw 1776, you know that by play between Jefferson and Adams, and they're both dying to go home to their wives, and so on. Uh, and so what do they do? They have nothing to do but talk to each other. They have to eat together. They see each other for seven, eight hours a day. Then they have dinner together, and so on. You've got to either kill somebody, or leave, or move towards some kind of conciliation and agreement. And that was made easier by the fact these people knew each other. Uh, they had read the same things. They had common assumptions about government. They had all read Locke. They had read Montesquieu. They had probably had read uh, Hobbes. Gordon will tell you more about that. They came from similar backgrounds. They came from similar religions for the most part. They were all uh, Republicans in some sense, more uh, or another. And they all believed that there was a great crisis facing the country. So they started off with a lot of favorable uh, political circumstances to reach an agreement. That doesn't mean that it was easy. This went on for four months, easily. But they used some common political tactics, which I'm glad you mentioned here. The first, the most important thing in politics in a legislative chamber is setting the agenda. If you can get your plan to be the basis of discussion, even if you don't get all of it, you're a big, big step ahead. Henry Blotkin can truly tell you lots about this. And what does uh, Madison and the Virginia people do? They get there two weeks early. Bad enough being in a hot Philadelphia in a closed room for, during the summer. They get there early and they plot and caucus and they come up with a full Virginia plan, which is quickly presented and becomes the basis, by no means 100%, but becomes the basis of discussion. That's a great political tactic, and they seize on it. Second political tactic, if you can't reach a decision, avoid it uh, in some way or another. Be ambiguous in your language. Delay what you're going to do. Pass the buck to somebody else. Uh, use language which, as Gordon said, has to be interpreted later on. And so, uh, look at the things they come up with. The election of the president. Uh, you know, we mentioned Bush v. Gore and the Electoral College. What we do know is that nobody had any idea how the Electoral College would work, uh, and it didn't matter. The first president, however you did it, was going to be George Washington. So why should we go to all this trouble? And Roche makes a big deal of this. Everybody seized on the Electoral College as a great system because they didn't have to figure it out how it would operate. In fact, it never operated the way people thought it might. It had to be amended very quickly. It's screwed up some things, uh, but it got them through the big crisis. Voting rights. Who should have the right to vote? Big question. You know, should there be a property qualification? Obviously not women, not slaves, uh, but what about poor people? Uh, and what do they do? They pass the buck. You, know, you can vote for Congress if you can vote for the state legislature. Somebody else will figure this out. Uh, slavery. Big issue, as you'll see. Uh, what do we do about that? Don't mention it. <laughs> the word slavery is not in the Constitution. Right? There's some ambiguous, roundabout language that applies to slaves. But the main thing they did is say, we're going to wait 20 years to figure this out. Uh, after 20 years, we can stop the importation of slaves, but we'll all be dead by then. Uh, so, so let somebody else worry about it. And finally, how do you sign the thing? You know, there's disagreement there uh, in the Constitutional Convention. How do you make this look like something people ought to support? So look at the language. It's signed by the unanimous approval of the states represented. Not by the people there, but by the states. And so, as I mentioned before, Hamilton signs for New York, 
So New York has agreed to the Constitution under this formula, although two of the three delegates actually opposed the Constitution. And finally, great political tactic, make a deal. Provide something for everybody. Uh, the northern states are very concerned about a strong federal power over commerce and international commerce. And so you get the very strong power of Congress to regulate commerce among the states and among nations, uh, the basis for uh, upholding the Health Reform Act, uh, ultimately, by the way. But the South gets something, too. The South gets this three-fifths rule in which their representation will be based not just on the number of whites, but also on three-fifths of other persons. Who are these other persons? They're slaves. But the representation of the South gets exaggerated, increased, because they count slaves, although, of course, slaves can't vote, hold property, or, you know, move outside of their plantation. Uh, common political tactics. And the political character is particularly illustrated by the so-called Connecticut Compromise. Now, we've all heard about this, right? The large states wanted representation by population in Congress, and the small states wanted representation on the basis of equality. Every state would have the same representation. And so, uh, supposedly, we come up with a compromise authored by delegates from Connecticut, in which one house would be on the basis of population, the House of Representatives, and one house would be on the basis of states, our present Senate. Uh, well, it's more complicated than that. Uh, first of all, the Connecticut Compromise was changed later on. One of the things in the original Connecticut Compromise was that only the House of Representatives could initiate taxes and spending bills following the practice of the British Parliament. That's been eliminated. If you read the Constitution, there's no difference between the Senate and the House. Uh, and there were also other things like uh, uh, reapportionment, the admission of new states, and these were all questions at the time. But the basic point I make to you is that the Connecticut Compromise is not a compromise uh, as the delegates saw it. And let me read to you. This is a bit extensive. Now let me read to you what happens on the climactic day of the debate, which is on June uh, 16th. Uh, okay. uh, the Connecticut Compromise, so-called, has been adopted by a vote of five to four, not an overwhelming victory. Uh, and Mr. Randolph, who's the governor of Virginia and the head of the Virginia delegation, says this. The vote of this morning had embarrassed the business extremely. All the powers given to Congress in the report was founded on the supposition that a proportional representation by population was to prevail in both branches of the legislature. When he came here this morning, his purpose was to have offered some propositions that might, if possible, have united a great majority of votes, and particularly might provide against the danger suspected on the part of the smaller states. But finding from the preceding vote that they, the so-called smaller states, persist in demanding an equal vote in all cases, that they have succeeded in obtaining it, and that New York, if present, would probably be on the same side, he could now but think we were unprepared to discuss this subject further. It will probably be in vain to come to any final decision with a bare majority on either side. Now here's the threat. For these reasons, he wished the convention might adjourn, that the large states might consider the steps proper to be taken in the present solemn crisis of the business, and that the small states might also deliberate on the means of conciliation. This is really tough stuff. We don't like it. We're prepared to end this convention. You better do something for us. All right? So there's a threat. Mr. Patterson, our own Mr. Patterson of New Jersey, which was eager for this Connecticut Compromise, <coughs> responds, Mr. Patterson thought with Mr. Randolph that it was high time for the convention to adjourn, that the role, rule of secrecy ought to be rescinded, and that our constituents should be consulted. 
no conciliation could be admissible on the part of the smaller states on any other ground than that of an equality of votes in the second branch. If Mr. Randolph would reduce to form his motion for an adjournment sine die, which means that's the end, uh, he would second it with all his heart. So you've got a very explicit threat or bluff uh, and the calling of the bluff by Patterson. You want to walk out? Fine. Let's do it. I'm ready to second your motion. And what happens? What happens? Let me just give you one more thing. Mr. Randolph responds. Mr. Randolph had never entertained an idea of an adjournment since then and was sorry that his meaning had been so readily and strangely misinterpreted. He had in view merely an adjournment till tomorrow <laughs> in order that some conciliatory experiment might, if possible, be devised. And in case the small states should continue to hold back, the larger might then take such measures. He would not say what, as might be necessary. Bluff, response, and the bluff is withdrawn. Joe? Were, were there, uh, what, how, what was the number of states? Were there five small ones with four, four big ones there? There were five, four, and four against the Connecticut Compromise. But the four against were all the large states and the five? No, the I'm going to get to that. No, strangely enough. Now, New York, for example, is against uh, 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 proportional okay. representation. Why? New York's a big state. You know? And even then, and it was, I didn't know, but it was going to become a big, big state. Why is it against this? Raises your mind. So, uh, the bluff is called, and then Madison in his journal says this. On the morning following before the hour of the convention, a number of members from the larger states met for the purpose of consulting on the proper steps to be taken in consequence of the vote in favor of an equal representation in the second branch. Several members from the larger states also attended. The time was wasted in vague conversation on the subject without any specific proposition or agreement. Uh, and then they went through the different times. Others said this, some said that, and so on. It is probable that the result of this consultation satisfied the small states. They had nothing to apprehend from a union of the larger in any plan whatever against the equality of votes in the second branch. All right? So they're giving up. And that afternoon, or later that morning, uh, Governor Morris of uh, Pennsylvania said, maybe we ought to reconsider this. He makes a motion to reconsider. Nobody even seconds the motion to reconsider. The fight is over uh, on July 16th and 17th. Maybe I said June, I meant July. Uh, so what's happened here? Uh, well, Madison says, uh, the motion to reconsider was probably approved by several members who either despaired of success or were apprehensive that the attempt would inflame the jealousies of the smaller states. Right. This is the climactic debate and climactic vote in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and it results in the victory of those who support the Connecticut Compromise. And from then on, there are still other controversies and so on, but it's clear from that point on there's going to be a Constitution and we're going to continue to maneuver to get whatever we can from it. Three-fifths rule, the commerce power, and some other stuff so forth. Uh, but uh, now on it's downhill. What went on here? You know, uh, you know, why did some states change their minds as they did from one vote to another? Uh, why did uh, you know, Massachusetts, which is a really large state in, uh, in terms of population, divide its vote and actually not vote on the critical vote? Some people have suggested that Elbridge Gary, a famous name, the Gary Manda, uh, was bribed. Uh, and that, you know, he actually took money uh, to vote the way he did. Uh, why did Georgia keep switching from no to I, voting no on July 16th, that is, uh, no in terms of the compromise, and other times in favor of it? Uh, what's going on here? One thing that's going on is Congress is meeting, and Congress is deciding what's going to happen to the Western territories. The Northwest Ordinance, which is one of the most important acts in American history, is passed. And what the Northwest Ordinance says is three things. We're going to somehow get commerce flowing down the Mississippi, which is very important to southern states, and we're going to have uh, Congress is committed to that. 
Second of all, we're going to admit new states. There were many people, including our friend Gary, who said, let's forget about the western states. Only the eastern states will have representation in the Congress from now on. Screw them. Uh, Northwest Ordinance says, no, these states, these territories will become states. And third, there will only be three to five new states. Sm big states geographically, not tiny ones like New Hampshire and Vermont, which means the western territories will not overwhelm the original 13. So take it easy, uh, you know, we will be okay. Um, but what about the big question? Is this large states versus small states? And you know, when you think about it, this is a very abstract kind of thing. What is there about a large state that's different from a small state other than the number of people in it? Uh, and this is kind of abstract. Isn't there something more substantial than this? Well, it turns out there is, because there's one moment in the Constitutional Convention, in Madison's notes, in which he says, he, he lets the cat out of the bag. It seemed to me, it seemed now to be pretty well understood that the real difference of interest lay not between the large and small, but between the northern and southern states. The institution of slavery formed the line of discrimination. There would be five states on the southern, eight on the northern side of this line. Should a proportional representation take place, it was true the northern side would still outnumber the other, but not in the same degree at this time, and every day would tend toward an equilibrium. And this is a real thing that's going on here. What? We're talking about we're talking about real interest. Slavery is a real interest, yeah. uh, rather than large versus small. And what's this supposition? What is assumed at this time is that the southern states would grow in population much faster than the northern states, oh. both through slave growth and through natural growth of white residents and immigration and so on. And so if you want to talk about the foresight of the Founding Fathers, they figured it out 200 years in advance that the Sun Belt would be where the population <laughs> would grow. Uh, now it wasn't true during the 19th century, northern states grew much faster than southern states. But the supposition at the time, which is the important thing, is southern states are going to grow. If you had proportional representation, eventually the southern states would overwhelm uh, the northern states in population. And in fact, the first census that's taken in 1790 shows that is happening, uh, that population is growing faster. And so many years ago, uh, inspired uh, by Henry Plotkin, as it turns out, I did a kind of mathematical analysis. Suppose you see, what's the correlation between size of state and the vote on these measures? Uh, and you see the correlation between slave status and the vote on these matters. I won't go into the mathematics, although it's fairly simple, but you all know. A perfect correlation is 1.0. Two things are perfectly related to one another. Uh, the correlation between the size of states and their votes is 0 0.30. That's significant. That's real. But the correlation between slavery, slave status, and the vote is 0.85. Much stronger relationship. And it begins to explain why is New York you know, taking this position of state equality because it's a free state. You know, why is North Carolina, which is a small state in terms of population, in favor of uh, proportional representation in both uh, houses? Because it's a slave state. Uh, and so uh, there's a difference there. And when people lost this vote, they lost on the basis of slavery, not on the basis of uh, size of state. Um, so. Uh, now, that's what happens there. But the final thing that happens on this issue is it gets accepted. People cave in that discussion on July 17th. They say, all right, we've lost on this. This is a big issue of principle. It's an even bigger interest issue of interest. But we lost. And the question is, do we go on? is the continuation of the Constitutional Convention, is the redrawing of the instrument of government more important than our particular interest in this subject. And the losers, they are losers, accept that and go on. Um, and some people still do not accept uh, that. 
Uh, there are liberals who are still complaining that uh, the states have equal representation in the Senate. Isn't it terrible that Idaho has the same representation as California? Can't we change that? Why doesn't Obama change that? The people on the left. You know, people who don't even read the Constitution, which says the only part of the Constitution which can't be changed by his own terms, the only single part is the equal representation of states in the Senate. That's the one thing that's unamendable. You'd have to amend the Constitution twice. Amend it to take that out, and then amend it uh, to change it. And no, that's not going to happen. Uh, but what this represents is what it's been called the ethics of responsibility. That politicians who adhere to this ethics worry more about the consequences of their actions than about whether they are in principle right or wrong. And these guys, you know, accept the ethics of responsibility. The consequences of failure are too great to accept even though we've lost this critical fight. Questions up to this point? It, I, I think most of the states had their own constitutions at this point yeah. in time. So what role did those state, con it, did, it, did that have any influence? On oh yeah, yeah, I mean I read that. John Adams wrote a, a big thing, what do you call it? Defense of the Constitutions of the United States. Big source book defending particularly the principle of uh, checks and balances. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff copied uh, from different constitutions. Uh, Massachusetts was particularly important. Uh, there was no question uh, as to whether or not the slave population should be considered uh, when it comes to representation. Oh, that was a big question. Well, where was I mean, you didn't mention that. Uh, and that that was one of the things that they still, but then there was a they, deal made. They hadn't got the right to vote, but they're right. represented. Well, they're not represented, they're counted. They're, they're counted. Represented. I mean, that's right, they were counted. Right. Well, is it, how fair is that? Well, it's not Why fair at all. Why do they accept that? Not just a matter of fairness. By the way, that clause is in the Articles of Confederation, too. They didn't just invent the, the three-fifths clause. Uh, but it was a deal. We will count your slaves. We, the North, will agree to that. You, in turn, will agree to a strong power of Congress over interstate and foreign commerce, which is what we, in the North, particularly New England, are interested in. That's the deal. <laughs> we get commerce, you get slaves. You get representation uh, or counting of slaves in representation. And people objected that, you know, how can you do this? You know, but, <laughs> you know, how can you do lots of things? Anyway. How, how much uh, controversy was there over the full faith and credit clause? Mm -hmm. Well, that was that in the Articles of Confederation also. I see. So that that was from the beginning accepted mm -hmm. that every state would give full faith and credit to the laws of every other state? Yeah, and it's never been clear exactly what that means. Especially <laughs> uh, about marriage. Especially about marriage. Not very doubtful. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, slavery. Gay marriage and so on. Well, slaves, you know, they were supposed to be returned if they were escaped and so on. Yeah, and then but isn't that the basis of the Dred Scott decision, for instance? But, well, Dred Scott is even stronger because it says it's a limitation even on the free states. You know, the slave yeah, states right. can have slavery, but free states can't yeah, prohibit slavery. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's property, and you have to return people's property. Uh, Bobby. I just wanted you to repeat her question. Uh, if you can. <laughs> uh, well, it was on the full faith and credit clause. You know, why was that in there? And the simple answer is it was in the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and the longer answer is, how do you have a, a union in which states are making major sta uh, laws and yet they're not going to be accepted? That's not a single government anymore. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, not only were the slaves the elephants in the room, but uh, someone who didn't know American history wouldn't have any idea from reading, at least what we've read so far, that there were Native Americans who had been here an awful lot longer. They were just totally ignored. Uh, but I well, they were totally written out because the representation specifically excludes <laughs> Indians not taxed. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I have a question of, of, of a broader one of uh, who we the people were, who was reading this stuff, which is at a very high level of writing. Uh, what was the literacy of the population? Was there, were there any literacy tests for voting, et cetera? There were no literacy tests for voting. Uh, you know, there were property tests, which was somewhat uh, overlapping. 
Uh, but I think literacy was pretty high among the white male population. I mean, newspapers were very popular, widely used and widely read. Who, who was doing the teaching? Or it's probably no Mostly no. church schools, I think, would you say? <laughs> no, I, well, there were no public schools. Uh, not yet. Uh, not yet. And even universities were, you know, religious institutions. Rutgers was, you know, Dutch Reform, and Harvard was congregationist, I guess. Like I say, I have a problem. Yeah. Actually, uh, well, I'll sort of throw it in the Yeah. Is it fair to say that people at the convention thought one of the deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation was that it had too much democracy? No, I. Uh, well, some people didn't like too much. Yeah, I mean, uh, state legislatures are uh, scenes of turmoil and so on. The basic concern is that the governments, the state governments, have too much power. Uh, and Hamilton in '15, you know, really rips into this. You can't have a government imperio in imperium. You know, there's one government, and when you're treating states as state governments, you're not getting at the essence. You've got to get the national government into direct contact mm -hmm. with the people. They've got to be able to coerce them and, and presumably so promote their interests. Were a lot of the state governments much more democratic than what came out of the country? Some were. Some were. Some had, they had restrictive uh, suffrage in many places. Of course, you know, six or seven had slavery. None but of them had women uh, voting, although New Jersey sir, tried I mean, for didn't one. Didn't Hamilton and others say that um, the problem with state governments as they were set up was that it didn't check the majority from being in tyrants. Like yeah. in, in Rhode Island, which was a crazy... No, Rhode Island, but, you know, even Virginia. Jefferson has this great statement saying 169 tyrants are just as bad as one. 169 being the number in the Virginia legislature. <laughs> you mentioned that the, the only article that can't be uh, amended is the one that gives equality of the states in the Senate. Does that include proportional representation in the House? No, no, no. The so equality of states in the Senate. So that theoretically could be changed to... Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You know, there are some Tea Party people running for office on the basis of revoking the 17th Amendment, which is the one that provides for direct election of the senators. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, this is supposed to be a populist movement. They don't want senators to be elected by the people. It's just ludicrous. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, one last question. Um, you talked earlier about a continental vision, and I know this was a national vision. Did they, uh, as individuals, see the United States or the country going past the Mississippi? I mean, that was all owned by other countries. Did they have a vision that extended all the way to the Pacific Ocean? Well, I'm sure some people did, uh, you know, but uh, not an imperialist vision at that point, you know, but when you know, Napoleon got uh, hard up for money and so on and was willing to sell Louisiana to Jefferson, who of course was a believer in small government, <laughs> you, know, you know. Another example of, you know, results are more important than principles, you know. He didn't have any power to do this, but he made this deal, you know, $15 million and you get uh, this huge amount. Of and then I think the, the continental, the push then begins after the Louisiana Purchase and, you know, and Lewis and Clark find out there's an ocean at the other side, and, you know, and yeah, all those events. Uh, so, a lot happens uh, here, uh, and, but it succeeds. And I think one reason it succeeds is that there are a huge number of roll calls, uh, but there is no state at the Constitutional Convention that is persistently in a minority. Sometime or other, on some of these cleavages and so on, a state ends up on the winning side. Uh, and uh, Gordon, I think the first or second time I talked to him when he came here, he had this great definition of democracy. It's a system in which you don't always lose. It doesn't mean you win uh, or win a lot of time. You don't always lose. And the Constitutional Convention, which is not a democracy, nobody lost all the time. And so all the delegates, or at least the states, uh, could support that. Uh, moreover, you do this detailed roll call analysis, there were never more than three states that always hung together, uh, majority or minority. There were shifting coalitions. Uh, and that really is necessary for success in a legislative body. And one of the reasons Congress is going nowhere, regardless of the elections, 
uh, is because we have such rigid and extreme factors, there's almost no crossover. It makes it very difficult to do anything. Um, final thing I want to say, just a few minutes, is what the convention teaches us uh, and the Constitution in terms of larger lessons. Um, it teaches us about politics, it teaches us about political science. Uh, Franklin's conclusion that Gordon read uh, last week uh, is a statement of political responsibility. You know, doubt your own wisdom. Uh, you may be wrong. Uh, you know, accept uh, this product as the best that we can achieve at this time. Uh, it tells us something about politics is a matter of ideas and it's a matter of interest, but it's both. And the melding of ideas and interests is what makes for successful politics. And they did that, it seems to me, at the convention. It also teaches us something about personal values, uh, the Federalist in particular. I think that the Federalist teaches, or at least I tell my students this, is that intellect and words and thought matter. That you, you know, there's something important about writing and talking and communicating. It is not simply who's got their foot on your throat. Uh, it teaches you uh, that dedication can make a difference. If you really try, uh, you may be able to achieve something. Uh, the convention, the Constitution was by no means a sure thing, even when they began writing it, and certainly in the ratifying convention. They made mistakes. Uh, you know, their vision of the future in terms of empirical things was wrong in some ways. They certainly screwed up the presidency, but maybe that was the best they could do. They certainly were wrong about population trends until uh, the end of the 20th century. Uh, but, uh, so they were not these demigods who knew everything. These were ordinary people who were pretty smart, got a lot of things right, and, uh, and left a lot of things to be determined later. But they also taught us uh, a couple of things, that you can be both successful and civil. And that's the point I made about Federalist number one. Uh, it's some rough language, and certainly uh, Hamilton does not love his opponents, but he does not call them the kinds of things that politicians uh, call one another today. Uh, he didn't doubt their birthright either. Uh, and so you can have both, and that's a great lesson. And it's possible to achieve democratic government if you work very hard at it. Uh, you know, the, uh, the final line uh, of uh, the Constitutional Convention, supposedly, probably an apocryphal story, is uh, Benjamin Franklin's leaving you know, at the end, and he runs into a woman on the street, and she says, well, Dr. Franklin, have you given us a monarchy or a republic? Uh, and supposedly he says, uh, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. <laughs> My final lesson to the students is it's up to you people to see if you can keep it.